Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and a proud member. And it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Provost and Vice President of Bard College at Simons Rock, Dr. Ian Bickford. The phrase early college often evokes a variety of responses and, and ideas. Some think of the AP classes they may have taken in high school or assume that it means taking college and high school classes simultaneously. But for the purposes of today's conversation, it actually means early college, like enrolling in college when you're in the 11th grade, that kind of early college. This is the experience of students who enroll in Bard Colleges. In 2001, Bard College established one of the nation's first public early colleges in New York City. And they laid the groundwork for an, a national early college network, which now includes programs in Newark, Baltimore, New Orleans, and of course, Cleveland. This model has demonstrated that en early entry into college can lead to greater academic achievement, social resiliency, and career success, especially for female, minority, and lower income students. In addition to the early barred early colleges, there are now hundreds of early college programs in the United States, supported by national and state legislation. The College and High School Alliance is one of the, an expanding coalition of national organizations carrying the early college movement forward. Cleveland, meanwhile, is at the forefront in providing the potential of the early college model with the addition of a second Bard High School early college campus this fall. So the question we hope to answer today is this, what can we learn from the Bard early college model? And if this model is so successful, should we reconsider maybe when high school ends, perhaps? When college begins? Dr. Ian Bickford was appointed provost and vice president of Bard College at Simons Rock on January 1st, 2016. A specialist in early modern literature and an influential leader in the early college movement, Dr. Bickford is the first alum of the college to serve in this role. He began his professional affiliation with Bard in 2007 as a member of the faculty, first at Simons Rock and then at Bard High School Early College in Queens, New York. And he has since participated in the establishment of new Bard early college programs in Baltimore and Harlem. Prior to becoming provost, Dr. Bickford served as the founding dean of Bard Academy at Simons Rock, as well as the dean of Bard Early Colleges, providing academic support and guidance to Bard's public early college network. He holds an associate's degree from Bard College at Simons Rock, a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley, go Bears, and a Master of Arts from Stanford University, and a PhD from CUNY Graduate Center. That's the, that's the City University of New York. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Ian Bickford. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm especially glad to see so many students in the room. Um, so every year, uh, several times a year, uh, I speak to eighth, ninth, and 10th graders who are assembled in auditoriums, cafeterias, libraries, classrooms to hear about early college. And I ask them right at the beginning to raise their hand if they have a math teacher. And every hand goes up. And at this point, I ask them to keep their hands up if their math teacher gives them homework. At this point, most hands are still raised. And finally, I ask them to keep their hands up if they think when their math teacher goes home, their math teacher does math. And the hands drop, <laughs> nearly all of them always. It isn't that there are no active practitioners of their subject among middle and high school teachers. There are, and talented ones in every area of study. Instead, the dropping hands signal a disconnection in the way we ask students at a crucial moment in their intellectual development to think about learning and its value. An important distinction between high school and college, although the presence or absence of practitioners cannot be generalized, is the simple but in high school often elusive conviction that learning and doing are inherently connected. 
that teachers come to teaching out of a genuine love of their subject, such that they have gone as deeply into it as existing knowledge allows and are actively engaged in digging still deeper, creating new knowledge, and that at some point, it becomes more than desirable, but absolutely necessary in one's education to interact with people who practice what they teach. The question is, at what point at Bard we think earlier is better? The branch of education known as early college recently celebrated 50 years since the founding of Simon's Rock the nation's first early college in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. That milestone coincides with the approaching 150th anniversary of the birth, also in Great Barrington, of W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote, the things that stand in the way of civilization can be met in but one way, by the breadth and broadening of human reason. Du Bois' legacy, and the educational principles and practices deriving from Simon's Rock share more than a birthplace. Um, in an appearance at Simon's Rock uh, last year commemorating Du Bois, the civil rights leader Bernard Lafayette Jr. recalled that his friend and colleague Martin Luther King Jr. sought admission to Morehouse College at age 15 because he understood the dramatic scope of the work ahead of him and saw no reason to delay. And on the same stage, this past spring, um, NAACP President Cornell William Brooks described the early college movement as an important step forward in the fulfillment of Du Bois' legacy, um, calling for educational opportunity as essential for an inclusive democracy. Why wait? We often ask students like those I described earlier who express misgivings about whether and how learning is valued in conventional high schools, um, why wait to start college? The question um, sometimes prompts the rejoinder, I want to say more often from parents than from students, what's the hurry? Uh, life is not a race, education should be lifelong, and our purpose at Simon's Rock and the Bard Early Colleges is not to turn up the pressure in the already pressurized environment of American education. Rather, it is to provide the right level of challenge at the right time. We can't ignore, though, that many of our students are explicitly in a hurry, exactly like Dr. King, to contribute solutions to the world's accelerating problems. It's actually, it's, it's less this very reasonable hurry on the part of our students that concerns me today um, than an incumbency for educators and policymakers to hurry our own response to a need for greater excellence paired with greater equity in the education of adolescents. That pairing is what eludes most school reform efforts. Early college, in contrast, is a proven approach to improving quality while reducing achievement gaps and increasing college persistence and completion by considerable margins. It does this, as Bard's president Leon Botstein writes, through the elimination of the enormous academic and pedagogical, pedagogical chasm between high school and college. Bard College, under President Botstein's leadership, acquired Simons Rock in 1979 by mutual agreement with Simons Rock's founder, Elizabeth Blodgett Hall, who had been the headmistress at Concord Academy in Massachusetts and noticed a systemic redundancy between the last years of high school and the first years of college. The women who left Concord for Bryn Mawr were, if anything, overprepared. And Mrs. Hall's concept for her new school was to give them a more logical bridge to higher education simply by allowing them to start college two years early. The model worked. It was instead the audience for early college that surprised its early practitioners. Students in elite schools were understandably reluctant to leave for a context so radically different from what they knew Simon's Rock answered a need instead for students whose high schools could not provide them with appropriate intellectual stimulation, whose curiosity was dampened in mediocrity and rote learning, and whose independence was drowned in pressures, social and academic, to perform rather than think and conform rather than grow. This is what President Botstein wanted to encourage, and it was what, what Mrs. Hall had also come to understand. The last two years of high school for too many students were simultaneously unstimulating and stressful. They constituted a waiting period that was worse than neutral. 
uh, as the extraordinary energy, curiosity, and imagination that characterize adolescence can as easily express as depression, anxiety, and disaffection. High school students today spend an increasing proportion of their time thinking about getting in and going to college. I think this might feel familiar to some people in the room, and yet ironically, the anticipatory process and experience which is enforced upon them, they don't choose it, we do that to them, has the effect of veiling what college actually is, what actually goes on in college classrooms, what college professors actually expect from their students. Applying to college tells students virtually nothing about what to expect in college. And the measures by which college admission is granted often have very little to do with what success in college requires. We recognize this as a large part of why first-generation college students struggle so mightily. A student with just one older sibling in college has a much higher chance of completing college than a first-born, first-generation student. College for them is not an undiscovered country. They know a traveler who has presumably from time to time returned. Yet even children of college-educated parents encounter an enormous academic and pedagogical chasm between their preparation for college and what they find when they get there. High school, conventionally conceived, does not prepare students for college. At best, it prepares students to apply to college and this preparation, so-called, exerts a significantly damaging influence in the way students learn to think about their education, about themselves, and about each other. At Bard, we've understood for decades that students who start college early bring an energy and a capacity to their learning, undisturbed by the frustrations and pressures of the last years of high school, that actually enhances the total college experience. By eliminating the 11th and 12th grades, our students don't lose very much and they gain much more. The Simons Rock idea that age doesn't define intellect and many students are ready for a greater challenge at a younger age revealed something important about the artifice of what seemed like immutable existing structures, that the high school to college timeline is excessively prolonged and years nine through 12 aren't meaningfully connected to years 13 through 16, the college years. A shift toward a more systemic solution to stagnant and racially disparate high school performance, again quoting Bard's president, came with the insight that it is more difficult to get from a poor community to college than it is to bring a good college to a poor community. This is what we did when, in 2001, New York City School Chancellor Harold Levy asked President Botstein to create an experimental early college, drawing on the valuable experience of working with younger students at Simons Rock, yet embedded within the public school system. It was quickly clear in the development of what would become the first Bard High School Early College, or BSEC, which started in Brooklyn, then moved location to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, that this would require the Simons Rock model to evolve to include the ninth and 10th grades in its program of study. If those grades were taught by college professors with a deep commitment to adolescent learners, the same professors who would later teach the same students in a rigorous course of college study, we could serve a substantially greater diversity of students we learned with the same standards as those practiced at Simons Rock and with similar academic outcomes acceleration to college effectively became a radical form of access to college. At that time, there were uh, only a small handful of early college and dual and concurrent enrollment programs in the United States. The next year, having supported the creation of Bard's pilot campus, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched its own early college high school initiative which spurred rapid growth of the concept. Um, there are now well over 300 early college programs nationally with the greatest concentrations in Texas, New York, California, North Carolina, Georgia, Washington State, and of course, Ohio. In addition to Simons Rock, Bard College now operates nine full and part-time public early college programs in New York, Newark, Baltimore, New Orleans, Hudson, and here in Cleveland where, this fall, we added a second campus on the east side under the leadership of my colleague, Provost Domain Williams, who is also the principal of BSEC Cleveland West and who's here today. Domain, would you stand for a second? Uh, 
the American Institute for Research found in 2014 that students in dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment programs are more likely by a substantial percentage to graduate from high school, 5% more likely, to enroll in college, 10% more likely, and to complete at least a two-year college degree, 22% more likely. In the same year, an ACT-led study found similar results among early college programs in Texas. Quoting from that study, not only were students with dual credit more likely to progress toward a degree over time, but they also had a greater chance of completing a bachelor's degree in four, five, or six years. The five-year degree completion rate for students with dual credit was greater than the six-year rate for students with no dual credit. More students are finishing college, and they're finishing more quickly. And the High School and College Alliance, to which Bard College belongs, reports that 90% of students from 100 representative early college high schools received a high school diploma compared with 78% nationally, and of those who enrolled in college after high school, 86 persisted from their first to second year, whereas the national average is 72%. Recent questions about the early college model, despite these promising results, have tended to focus on rapidity of growth and anxiety about diminishing returns. Um, although we should note there is no evidence yet to suggest a decline in outcomes overall. The Wall Street Journal reports 70,000 high school students taking advantage of dual enrollment opportunities in the last school year, um, uh, 65,000 in Ohio, uh, that first number um, uh, was from um, a state that I don't have listed here, 65,000 in Ohio and 150,000 in Texas. In Massachusetts, which only this year launched its own statewide early college initiative despite being the birthplace of the movement, there is an understandable apprehension among educators and some policymakers about sustaining quality in the context of a rapid rollout. Uh, this is why the College and High School Alliance identifies and recommends the following as critical features of high quality dual and concurrent enrollment programs. They should involve collaboration by high school and college faculty within the same discipline. There should be efficient resource sharing between the K-12 and post-secondary systems and they should provide sustainable professional development to raise the rigor of the high school experience. The Bard Early Colleges presently enroll roughly 2,500 students in five states. 74% are students of color. 63% qualify for free and reduced lunch. They speak more than 40 languages at home. Uh, they have a 98% high school graduation rate compared to an 81% national average. The average in both New York City and Newark, even worse, is 68%. Upward of 90% receive an Associate of Arts degree concurrently with their high school diploma. I'll leave you for a second with this slide and move on to the next one. Totaling nearly 3,000 tuition-free degrees granted by Bard College to early college graduates since 2001. 97% of the class of 2008 completed a BA within six years of high school graduation, compared with 59% nationally, and incoming data for later cohorts is taking a similar shape. A recent independent study of our New York City campuses matching our students with demographic peers at traditional and specialized high schools described especially strong gains among students of color. To take just one example, 71% of black graduates from BSEC Manhattan and Queens completed a BA within four years of leaving high school, compared to 54% from specialized or selective high schools and 34% from traditional high schools. We are especially proud of this year's BSEC Cleveland West class of 2018 who will be the first cohort to graduate from that campus, having participated in both the high school and college programs. These 100 students who represent the city's racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity are thriving academically, with well over half maintaining a GPA of 3.0 or above. This is especially impressive 
in light of the fact that since the end of 10th grade, they've been enrolled full time in rigorous college courses in the liberal arts and sciences. BSEC Cleveland East opened this fall in response to several needs. First is the overwhelming demand for high quality early college options. There are around four times more applicants uh, to BSEC Cleveland West than available seats. Uh, second and related, is the importance of keeping our schools small rather than creating giant impersonal high schools. And finally is the value we find in serving multiple communities. At capacity, the two campuses together will enroll 1,000 students, which I understand to be around 10% of the public high school students in Cleveland. We are enthusiastic participants in an educational movement that extends far beyond BARD and we think it is healthy and positive that the full range of early college programs and practitioners in the United States reflects exactly the full range of college and university education. Early college is vocational, professional, liberal arts. It is public, private, urban, rural. It relies upon partnerships with community colleges, small four-year colleges, and research universities. Yet we also think there are features of the BARD approach evolved over a long period of time that explain why our especially strong outcomes uh, occur even within the broader early college community. Uh, each of our schools employs a full-time college faculty to teach both at the high school and college levels. The ninth and 10th grades are designed and taught by college professors who will later teach the same students in college classes, and this creates a seamless, coherent connection between high school and college. Um, at Bard Academy and Bard College at Simons Rock, uh, where we offer ninth grade through the Bachelor of Arts degree, we've fully integrated second secondary and higher education in a six rather than eight year arc. At the Bard High School Early Colleges, we create a meaningful bridge between high school and college, and students graduate not only with up to 60 transferable credits, but also with intimate familiarity with the academic and cultural expectations of higher education. They know they can succeed in college because they've already succeeded in college. The chasm between high school and college is entirely removed. We practice a writing and process-based pedagogy in which our faculty are trained and supported through Bard's Institute for Writing and Thinking. Students begin every year with a writing and thinking workshop. This is an intensive, multi-day exploration of texts and ideas uh, in which constructive discourse and a culture of respect are reinforced. Students gain a shared vocabulary for sharing ideas and responding to each other, even and perhaps especially when in disagreement. This foundation is visible during the rest of the year in our discussion-based seminar-style classrooms. Um, a student at BSEC Baltimore, Aubrey de Hinbo, said this. For me, the culture in a school is what determines how people perform. If we're in an environment where we feel we have nothing to look forward to and only the bare minimum is required, nobody's really going to care about learning. At Bard, things are different. When we disagree, there's no talking over the next person or belittling. We've learned how to share our opinions, substantiate them, and have discussions even outside of the classroom. Our emphasis on discussion is also essential to our curriculum, which is firmly rooted in the best traditions of the liberal arts and sciences. This, perhaps more than anything else, is what distinguishes the barred early colleges within the range of early college programs that are now emerging, and many of our students tell us it is what awakens them to the possibilities for their education, careers, and lives. A core curriculum in the humanities is joined with broad exploration of science, computing, math, and the arts. We really don't have preconceptions about where our students are heading. Instead, we want to broaden the path for them. And we think that this broadening, which comes through seeking to know the world in all of its aspects, rather than through a narrow professional aperture, is why graduates of liberal arts colleges are the least likely in the 21st century economy to be underemployed or unemployed. We are preparing our students to meet the things that stand in the way of civilization to return to Du Bois through the breadth and broadening of human reason. 
One of our graduates from BSEC Queens remembers this exposure to the liberal arts as generating an exponential increase in the way I learned things. This student, uh, whose name is Rebecca Ghani, is now a college senior at Simons Rock, writing a thesis on the effects of meditation and yoga on the brain, um, and also conducting research under a member of our psychology faculty on adolescent resiliency. Rebecca intends to pursue graduate school and a career in neuropsychology, but at BSEC, she said to me the other day, I think what ignited my love of learning was theater which taught me how to be more open with expression, how to interact with others, how to care for others and the spaces around me. Breadth of learning, exposure to many ways of knowing the world, theater as well as math, literature as well as biology, created a sense of possibility for her as well as a sense of responsibility. Narrow focus on a professional or vocational path wouldn't have produced this, even in STEM fields. There needed to be something else, something more. Education can take you far, Rebecca says, and BSEC was pivotal for me in realizing that. Uh, Rebecca is the first person in her family to go to college. Her mother from Trinidad finished middle school. Her father from Guyana finished high school. She grew up in Jamaica, Queens, where she attended district elementary and middle schools without strong academics. And in describing her prior education, she points to many of the signifiers of urban school settings we've come to identify with the failure of civic systems, um, daily drug deals on the playgrounds and the Manhattan skyline seeming like a different world. Rebecca shares these details, however, not to evoke a sense of imperilment, but nearly the opposite to say, this was my community. These were the people who cared about me, knew I was a good student, and wanted the best for me. It just wasn't clear what that would look like. She wanted to go to one of the more known, selective, or specialized high schools in New York City. She also interviewed at BSEC Queens, which was still a relatively new school and very much not her first choice. Um, although she had been at the top of her middle school class, she describes her education to that point as unchallenging. She had not, for example, been challenged to read very much, and she didn't like books. You can imagine her dawning realization of her predicament, um, that through New York City's Byzantine high school placement process, she found herself in a ninth grade where the entire first week was devoted to reading and writing. Um, I was an English teacher at BSEC Queens then, and while Rebecca wasn't in my ninth grade class, at a small, at a small school you sort of know everybody. Um, so I've known her now for six years, and she's somebody I really look up to. Um, in education, we talk a lot about transformation, um, but I'm not always sure we know exactly what we mean. Um, Rebecca was a ninth grader who hated reading. Six years later, she's a college senior who loves reading. In middle school, she had learned to excel at low expectations. She has now learned to excel at high expectations. These are extremely positive things, but they aren't the thing. They both hinge on something else um, uh, that is a little bit harder to articulate, um, but it's something like this. Rebecca believes that if she'd gone to a different, more conventional high school, even a good one, she would have continued on to college, probably close to home, and she says, it would have been good, but it wouldn't have opened my eyes. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Um, this is a topic close to my heart um, and, um, and one I love to talk about. So anything you'd like to know, anything you'd like to ask about, anything you'd like to talk about. Cool. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. The end came quickly. I wasn't expecting the end at that <laughs> moment. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it was a little. Um, today we're enjoying a forum with Dr. Ian Bickford. He's provost and vice president of Bard College at Simons Rock. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from every one City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphone today is, oh, there's, there she is, Bliss Davis. May we have our first question, please. Hi, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, I think Bard uh, College sounds like a, a great opportunity for a lot of kids. And I just was wondering if you might have some input on 
because these kids are younger when they uh, get out of the high school type program and go on to uh, a college a campus perhaps, uh, do they find the challenges, um, say, emotionally or, uh, because of their maturity age or whatever, uh, more daunting than uh, a student that's two years older? Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, so as you, as you know, our students graduate with up to 60 college credits, transferable credits, and bring many of those credits with them. Um, so they often start college at their next college in more conventional higher education settings as sophomores, in some cases juniors. Um, that means that in their classes, they're often uh, in, in cohorts with students older than them. Um, Remember, they're also they're going they're going into more conventional higher education settings around age 18, like most other people, and so there is an age cohort that they have to rely on. But what we find is that many of our students actually, when they um, uh, when they start at their next college, gra gravitate toward um, toward older people um, uh, and feel more comfortable around um, around older peers. Um, I think this is because. Um, uh, there, there's not a clear distinction between, um, between uh, academic maturity and social maturity. So as I described, our students spend four years in these classrooms with each other where they're, they're wrestling with really complicated ideas, um, uh, uh, really challenging um, uh, concepts and puzzles, and they're working this through together. You know, um, and our um, our curriculum and our pedagogy are um, are uh, um, are arranged in a way that um, that our students really have to develop a high sense of regard for each other, or it's not going to work. You know, um, our seminar style classrooms would require participation, respect for each other's ideas, um, and all of the things that characterize the best college classrooms. But I think it's actually something else. That is, um, uh, our students. Uh, learn that they are taken seriously by their professors very early on. You know, um, adolescents um, uh, are often taught to assume that they aren't taken seriously. You know, they're often um, they're often taught to assume that their um, their ideas aren't welcome in the adult conversations that matter. Um, our students are going off to uh, to institutions of higher education, four year colleges, um, with the experience of being part of the greater conversation about ideas with each other and with their faculty. Um, and we find that when they come back and they report back on their experience, um, they usually say that the 18-year-old college freshmen they're encountering are like really immature, you know? Um, so that's part of the answer. I think you can't, um, uh, you can't do the kind of academic work that we ask our students to do without growing up a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Hi, so you spoke a little bit about the gap between what a college admissions process requires of applicants and what is actually required to be successful once kids enter college. So this is kind of a two-part question. One, do you think that early college is truly fully scalable? And two, assuming it isn't fully scalable, what is required of colleges to make their application process more rigorous and to match what's actually expected of students once they get there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thank you. We're not proposing at this point that, um, that we fully replace secondary education with, um, with a, a two-year alternative. Um, that is, um, we don't see early college as, um, as a total solution to, um, to secondary education in the United States or higher education. Um, I actually think Cleveland right now uh, is our, our, our most important um, effort in answering the question that you just asked, um, how scalable is early college? Um, because I, I think that, um, that this educational experience might very well be exactly the right one for something like 10% of students um, within a given community. You know? um, and so as we're scaling toward that point, in this community in Cleveland, um, I think we'll find out a great deal about the real scalability of the of the enterprise. You know, um, uh, so far the lessons have been good. Uh, to your other question, um, uh, if not all students 
are going to um, uh, are going to um, start college two years early. Um, uh, what about the high school to college pathway? So first, um, uh, I happen to think that the um, the college and high school alliances recommendations for dual and concurrent enrollment programs are pretty good recommendations for communication between secondary and higher education generally. Collaboration between the higher ed community and, um, and the high school community of educators. Um, uh, some, uh, um, some greater exercise by college faculty to, to think about and recommend um, a high school curriculum. Um, our focus on test scores, um, I, I'll, I'll put aside the sort of general picture for now because that's a, that's a big context, context, but our focus on test scores for college admission, um, are, so, and we all know this, are not, are, are, not a, um, uh, are not a reliable measure for how somebody will, um, will perform in college, whether they'll persist and whether they'll, they'll graduate. Meanwhile, um, uh, the, the pressure to do well on test scores in the last years of high school in order to get into college um, exerts a significant influence in our students' experience of high school. Right? So it's a sort of empty exercise that we put a great deal of weight on, and the, the people who suffer from it are our students. You know, I, 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 don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, finally, um, it seems to me that those of us in higher education need to be a lot more thoughtful about what we're asking of our applicants. Um, um, my, uh, my experience of uh, many of the young people in my life is that um, at 16, 17, and 18, they're working extremely hard um, uh, to, um, to contort themselves into um, the most conventional possible um, uh, profile. That is, they know what they think colleges are looking for, and because it feels so important to get into the colleges they want to get into, they're trying really hard to become that person, right? Um, and so everything that, that might be unique about them, right, that might not, that might not read um, on, a, um, on a college application as what that college is, wants from, um, from you, from a student, um, is sort of set aside for those years. But those are years when it's extremely important to be who you are, you know? Um, and so we ask our students to, um, uh, to excel at conformity, you know, and to stand out by, um, by being the, um, uh, uh, by becoming the status quo, which I find to be a really interesting contradiction. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming and, and uh, thank you for your remarks. And more, most importantly, thank you for making this opportunity available to students in Cleveland. Uh, my question um, has to do with uh, how a college major is defined. Right. So early college completely blows up the the notion of um, of what what a college major is. Um, I mean, we we when we admit students into college, try, tend to you know put them in buckets, and, and mm -hmm. this essentially is rejecting that notion. Could you comment a little more about what the future of where we should think about that is. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually think that question speaks um, uh, as much to the importance of liberal arts education as it does to, to early college, right? Um, that is, it's not only at our, at our early college campuses at Bard that we feel that the first years of college should be, um, uh, should be about broad exploration of ideas in many subjects. So my story about, uh, about my student, Rebecca Ghani, um, partly it was about her starting college early, but partly it was about um, the, the transformational experience of learning from subjects that she wasn't ultimately going to study, right? Um, so for our students in early college, um, they have an opportunity to study broadly and to learn broadly about their world and the way that we practice in, um, in liberal arts institutions um, a little bit earlier in their, um, in their educational lives so that when they land in what is now the, um, the, 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 um, uh, the norm in higher education, which does ask them to think about what they want to do with themselves, what they want to do in their careers from the moment they get there, they have already had 
um, this experience of exploration. Now, I think that should be the norm also for students who go to college at a conventional age. There should be time in the first year or years of college where you really get to explore, where you get to change your mind without consequences. Um, and we find that, um, that our students who start out in, a, um, uh, in, um, in breadth of study, Right, with a with a core humanities curriculum and with um, with we ask we ask that they they um, they take courses in distribution requirements so everybody takes a science course and a math course and a language um, and a and a course in the arts um, that they actually um, when they apply to graduate school or go into the workforce actually haven't lost time and that they do um, in many instances better um, than their peers elsewhere who have gone into a into um, into a professional or vocational program. Um, I'm Dwight Hudson. I'm the Dean of Students at the Bard Early College Program on the Hello. East Side. Um, and also, I want to share, I'm a member of the very first graduating class of the Bard High School Early College Program. Um, so I wanted to connect some dots that I think is, and it has great resonance today. Today's the 32nd time I've spun around this world. Um, oh, happy birthday. <laughs> so it, it's of great meaning and a, a really privilege for me to sit here with these young people. I see them kind of on the same trajectory that I took myself and to have gone on to be a college professor myself and to have had the experiences I've had. Um, and it's not so much a question for my colleague, but a charge to the room. Um, as I work closely with these young people, we're trying to help them to come to terms with some of that figuring it out and connecting the dots and seeing the world bigger than what they've seen around their neighborhoods. Um, we need local support, right? Folks that are here in this room, uh, I charge you now to step into our, our hallways, to meet with our students, to connect with the young people, uh, to avail yourselves in ways that are transformative. And these are very simple things that can be done, right? Internships, connections with organizations that you may be working with. I would gladly love to have a conversation with you afterwards. So I'm sorry to, to hijack some, some air time right now. Yeah. But I think that these kinds of things are important because I'm seeing young Janasia right here like scribbling away crazy. <laughs> and I'm really excited that she's taking notes and having this experience. But I want to be able to connect her with the larger community and really you know, uh, put her in a space to take advantage of uh, things that are happening here in the Cleveland area. So by all means, I hope to have some time to speak with folks at the end of the afternoon. I should ask a question. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I was hijacking time. I'm being quite honest. I'm grateful uh, for you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I suppose um, I'll, um, I'll take the occasion to ask a question in your stead. Um, I, and I'm sorry to, 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 um, to overturn the normal structure here. It's, it's what we're used to doing at, um, at, at BARD. Um, uh, uh, because we have Domain Williams here, um, who has been so instrumental in um, in creating early college context here in Cleveland. Domain, I wonder if you could say a few words about um, about um, the experience of building a, now a, 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 an early college at its full capacity um, at, at BSEC Cleveland West, and also how it's going at the new campus. Uh, Domain. Messing up the script. Um, so I think a few things. I think a big part of this work is is um, based on access, right? So uh, when thinking through Cleveland, a lot of the questions I got first was why Cleveland, right? We were running a, a model, and we were predominantly on the East Coast, and then we came to the Midwest. Um, and a big part of that was access. Folks in Cleveland from the mayor's office, from the school district, um, came and visited um, in Newark and, and in Queens and saw these programs and said, could we tie this into the Cleveland plan, a, a, a series of reforms that are taking place here. Um, and so looking at the demographics of the populations, we saw a need um, for early college options. And so we, we opened in 2014. Um, expansion really has been focused on, um, really as, as Ian mentioned, the access. Um, how can we give this opportunity to as many students as possible. Um, really, this is not meant to be, as Ian mentioned, a fix all and this is a thing for every student, um, but we do want to have it be accessible to as many families as are interested. We don't want it to become an elite thing that happens in this little corner of Cleveland or any city, but something that is open to many families and many students who are interested. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the ideas of scale and, and where we're going really look at what, what does the access look like in the city for education? Um, many responding to families who are looking for good options um, 
options that are fitting the specific needs of the students and realizing that early college for many students is one of those. Um, it does address many of the concerns that families have around paying for college, um, preparation for college, dropout rates, um, and also just engagement while in closet, college. Many of our students have a really good attendance rate and I think a big part of that is that they find early college classes and these discussions more engaging than a typical high school experience that they may have said, okay, I could do this, I could get an A, but I don't really find this interesting. Um, so we want to push them in, in other ways. Um, part of it is getting through this, the curriculum and getting the credits, but another part of it is using these four years in an engaging way and feeling that you're growing as a person and that you're really um, going through some transformation. Um, and so that's what we, we seek to develop through, through the campuses. Um, and I will point out to, to Dwight's point, there has been a lot of uh, great uh, local support that I will you know, kind of um, thank both philanthropic and just in terms of partnerships, the public library, the Museum of Art. And part of what we do at BARD is also try to connect as much as we can to the local environment. So in New Orleans, we're working with the folks in New Orleans to make a specific version of early college. And in Cleveland, a specific version that matches this city and what um, the goals are and what the resources are. So I think that's, that's part of kind of the, globe, the bigger picture of this work. Thank you, Domain. So what I think makes uh, the early college model really special is that there's this expectation of all students are capable of excelling and should be pursuing some education beyond high school. Mm -hmm. And that's something that seems to be pretty pretty commonplace, like every adult in the building has that expectation. How do you take some of the lessons you learned in creating that strong college going culture at the Bard schools and transferring that to a traditional non early college high school? Yeah, um, I, as our network of schools grows, part of what we hope to be um, is a um, uh, is a network of model campuses for our communities. Um, it's never been our position that, um, that early college um, and Bard College should be synonymous. Um, um, for most of the history of, of Bard College at Simons Rock, they were, right? We were, we were um, for a long time, the only practitioners, and then, uh, um, uh, and then one among just a few practitioners of the idea. Um, so some of the things that we're trying to encourage, one is the, the, um, the as I've said a few times now, and it's worth repeating, um, the emphasis on the liberal arts in some form. Um, that is, this is, not about, um, this is not about accelerating students into careers if those careers aren't going to inform meaningful lives, you know? Uh, so I think that's an important lesson that we've learned that we would like other early colleges to, um, to, uh, to think about with us. Um, and, um, and we, um, we spend a lot of time thinking not only about what our outcomes are, um, because our outcomes are strong as they are for, for most early college high schools, um, uh, certainly for the, for our survey of the scene, um, but also what is, what is our students' experience, you know? Um, uh, how are our students responding to what they're learning? How are they responding to each other? Um, and how is that informing the next steps in their education and their lives? And so with that, because I've been looking for, for this opportunity, um, we have students in the room who, um, who have done the things that I've been describing. Um, so I wonder if there are any students who would, um, who would volunteer to tell me if what you've been hearing is true <laughs> um, and, um, and what early college has meant to you. that so I don't yeah um, <laughs> I, 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 um, you've listened to me for well over a half hour mm -hmm. have I got it right <laughs> and um, and what's your experience of early college how has it been meaningful to you um, um, well I'm Isis um, I think that my experience in early college has been very um, an amazing experience in my case it can be stressful and sometimes but it um, I think it really like uh, outreaches the way I think because 
Um, I, as I was looking for what high school to go to, uh, the question was, of course, about money in the future and what was accessible to me. And so when looking, uh, my mom was like, oh, there's this place called Bard High School Early College in the paper. And it seemed like something I wanted to gravitate towards, too, because I want to go to college and I really want to... Um, um, be successful in my future while also doing so many things that I can't think I can even push into one lifetime. Mm -hmm. But I think it also made me really think because there's a lot of people who don't go to college in my family. And that was one thing that I really wanted to do because it just seemed like just a really nice experience to have. Yeah. And so while going through a early college program, it made me notice how mature I can be in situations and how immature I can be in some situations. And it can show that uh, I can, I think one, another thing I've learned from an early college experience is devil, devil's advocate kind of action is mm -hmm. that you may not believe in one thing, but somebody else does. And it's like the action of knowing there's a line to be able to accept what they are at, while accepting yourself. So I think that's another thing I kind of gained a lot from an early college program. Another one I think I gained was knowing that your teachers, or in case early college, your professors, they're also people too, because yeah. you learn that they have emotions that you do. So yes, you might be upset that an assignment is due, but they are also extremely busy with their lives and what they do with their students. So I think that all in all, uh, while going to an early college, is that I've learned, uh, one, that I can be way more mature than a lot of people put me down for for my age. Mm -hmm. And I've also learned that as somebody who is going to be going into academics that are higher than most of my family, that I can reach for a lot that I, at the same time, don't think I can reach for. Yeah. Isis, what year are you in school? Um, I'm a first year, so I'm an 11th grader. Yeah. So our um, our terminology at BSEC is that um, uh, in place of 11th grade, we have the first year of college. And um, so we call 11th grade year one and 12th grade year two. Um, and do you, do you have thoughts about what's next? Um, a lot of work, of yeah. course, because um, uh, a motto that I've always been taught is nothing is for free. Yeah. And so you always want to work and strive for things that you want. And so um, I definitely know that there's probably going to be a lot of work for what I want to go for. Yeah. But I think that all in all, it'll be worth it because as for my family will have happiness of me going into college and being able to succeed, I'll also feel a bit of fulfillment and maybe a bit of um, knowledge of myself and being able to gain self like knowledge because I'm able to strive for something that a lot of people don't think I could strive for, especially coming from Cleveland. Of course, we're getting up there. <laughs> but um, especially coming from some place that can be seen as a bit more low class and not able to succeed, I think that'll also be able to show people, uh, not for myself, but I also want to show people who are younger for me and the future that we can strive for something and that we can make it somewhere while you can be a minority or a girl mm -hmm. or, uh, but you can just strive for something that is, that not only somebody can tell you what you are, but for you to say that this is what I am, this is what I can do. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, has the City Club considered a student speaker series, or is there one? There is one. That's great. Really good. Um, notice how much of what Isis said has to do with regard for others. Um, we get a little bit lost in, um, in um, conversations about education and education policy, about simply advancing through. Right? Um, increasingly, high school is about getting into college, and college is about getting a career. And all of us in the workplace know uh, that's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, um, one's working life is, um, is usually challenging, right? That is, um, uh, we all, in our adulthoods, wake up to pressures we sometimes didn't wish we had. And so we delay gratification for eight years, and this is remarkable, right? Um, eight years, I, this, is, um, this is not a length of time that, um, that any reasonable adult would delay gratification for something, but we ask our students to do that, right? Without thinking about what's happening now in front of them as inherently meaningful, right? Well, do your work in high school because that's the way to get into college. Do your work in college because that's the way to get a career. Uh, um, at its worst, it can feel like a trick that we're playing. 
you know. Um, so um, something I really want everybody here to pay attention to um, is, um, is what ISIS said about learning to respond to people with whom we disagree. Um, I, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that, um, that in this country our, our public discourse is nearly at a standstill. Um, but in this context, um, uh, those of us who teach in, um, in early colleges get to interact every day with young people who know how to talk to each other and know how to talk to each other when in disagreement with each other and also who recognize that their teachers are just people. And that translates into, I think, other forms of responses to authority that both, um, uh, that, that both um, constitute a form of sympathy Right, sympathy for um, uh, for um, um, uh, for those who seem like they have an outsized influence in our lives. They're just people who are struggling, right? Um, and also, and this is perhaps more important, um, uh, a confidence about challenging them, right? Because if your teachers are just people, and if politicians are just people, um, that means that you also, as a person, get to challenge them. It's incredibly meaningful, and it's something that I think um, uh, many young people leave their education um, uh, without the experience of. Thank you all. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum featuring um, the subversive Dr. Ian Bickford, <laughs> provost and vice president Bard, Co Bard College at Simons Rock. Our forum today is part of the Education Innovation Series sponsored by the Nordson Corporation Foundation. We thank you very much for your support of City Club education programming. Today's forum is also the Thomas F. and Marguerite Campbell Forum endowed by Tom and Peg Campbell. We thank them for their support. And we also welcome students today from Bard, early, early, Bard High School Early College West. There are so many words there <laughs> packed in. Uh, student participation in City Club Forums is provided by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation. We thank you for being here, and we invite you to consider joining our Youth Forum Council. If you're interested in that, talk to my good friend Julia Wong. That brings us to the end of our forum today. Thank you, Dr. Bickford. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club Forums on Ideastream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.